Our next speaker has studied in Bielefeld, and he studied... <laughs> What he did is he studied laser physics, and now he's working at the Max Planck Institute for Extraterrestrial Physics. And today he will explain you how it is possible to lose laser light to enhance distorted images that were taken from the Earth of stars and galaxies and nebulas. So I want to hear a really loud and warm applause for Peter Bushkamp with shooting lasers into space for science. <laughs> All right, thank you for the nice introduction. Thank you for coming here this evening. I'm very excited to speak at the conference. Finally, I find a talk where I can contribute um, after all those years. Um, I'm not going to talk about Bielefeld. You might want to hear something about that. I'm not, I'm not allowed to tell you, right? <laughs> okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about a bit what is in my field of expertise. Um, if there's one thing I want to bring across to you, then it is, it's not about a single person showing this to you this evening. Uh, this is a team effort, and a real team effort. Um, so most of the images are done by a colleague of mine, Julian Ziegeleder, and uh, the PI of the project, so the leader of the project, Sebastian Rabin, um, has contributed some slides. And I wouldn't be standing here today and showing you these uh, images uh, if it wasn't for a huge team and many people. And I, I hope this is reasonably complete, but I think there were even more. Uh, many people have um, tributed most and long years of their career into such a project. So this is never about something which a single person does and he or she finds something very cool and then saves the world. No, it's always a big, big team. Um, but before we actually see the lasers then uh, in working, um, we have of course to clarify why we do this. This is not just because we can, we can, but uh, there is a reason for that, because uh, if you want to get funding, you have to write a reason, and a reasonable reason, not just because we want to. <laughs> so in the first part, I will uh, introduce you uh, to the whole thing, and we'll talk about a bit about the problem which we want to uh, tackle with this kind of technique. Um, I will mostly present only uh, diagrams, not actual hardware blocks already so that you get the, the basic concept. So when we do astronomy, um, we do two types of things. We either do imaging, which is we maybe produce a nice image of a star, so that's a blob over there, or we take this image, maybe this little uh, blob over there, and make it into a spectrum. So we disperse the light, and then we look at, uh, at the uh, differential uh, intensity between the uh, diverse colors, or um, are there maybe, uh, for example, you see black lines in their absorption bands and, uh, and so on. To do such a thing, uh, you need a spectrograph, and in a spectrograph there's a thing called an entrance slit. So in this slit you have to put over your objects so that you don't get light from left or right next to the object to what you want to uh, observe or analyze so that you only get light from where you want it. The thing is now, um, this slit cannot be uh, made arbitrarily wide or, uh, or small because uh, the width of the slit uh, directly determines what kind of resolution you have in such a spectrometer, as it's called. This is a quantity which needs to be above a certain value when you want to do certain kinds of analysis. So it has a fixed width. So now if we look at an image, produced of one of the most capable telescopes on this planet, and we put uh, a representation for the slit over the star, okay, now it's white, let's make this black, then you see if you want to go for that star over there, you do have a problem already. As I said, you can't make the slit wider, but the, the, the star is actually larger than the slit, meaning that you lose light. Well, then you lose some light, no. If you want to do quantitative measurements, you want to have all the lights and all the pixels. So you can't get rid of them and just throwing something away. 
Um, so, but our image is looking like that. It's maybe nice, so, but can we do better? Yes, we can. And this is what we can achieve with adaptive optics. This is an image that has been produced with adaptive optics with a laser uh, AO-assisted system. And if I flip back and forth, you see there is a difference. All right. So, why is that? Why don't, don't we get these ideal images? The reason is because there is the atmosphere. The atmosphere is great for breathing. It's not that great for astronomy. So if you have a star up there somewhere in outer space, it can be very far away, so the photons might have traveled for 11 billion years, and now they finally hit the atmosphere, and then something happens which you do not want. OK, first they travel freely. There's a nice planar wave front, so it's not disturbed by anything. Maybe something, but that's not the scope of this evening, it's planar, it's nice. And if you actually have a satellite, it's very cool, because then you can directly record this undisturbed light. If you have something on the ground, well, um, you do get a problem, because the atmosphere introduces turbulence, because, well, the, uh, the air wobbles, uh, wobbles a bit, there are streams coming from all directions, there are temperature gradients in there, and these all uh, work together and make from this nice planar wavefront a crumbled one. If you have a perfect uh, image which you create, this is called diffraction limit. This is just limited by the size of your optics. So the wider your optics is, the nicer the resolution is of your image. If you then build a large facility with maybe two eight meter mirrors on the ground, well, you only get a seeing limited. Uh, image, seeing limited. The seeing is this wobbling of the atmosphere, as it's called. And that's about it. You can make it arbitrarily large. You won't get a better resolution than a backyard telescope of having 20 centimeters in diameter. So, um, yeah. Um, what to do? Um, there have been people, of course, thinking about this problem uh, longer. And the first idea came up in 1953. And some guy at Palomar Observatory uh, in California uh, said, well, if we had the means of continually measuring the deviation of rays from all parts of the mirror and amplifying and feedback this information so as to correct locally the figure of the mirror in response to the Schlieren pattern, we could expect to compensate both for the seeing and for the inherent imperfection in the optical figure. Uh, what? So if we could somehow get rid of this wobbling or counteract that, then we could, uh, could get this perfect diffraction-limited imaging we get in space also on the ground. In the 1970s, the US military started to experiment on that. Well, I guess the Russians too, but it's not, yeah. It's, it's known that the uh, US started at Starfire Optical Range. In 1982, they uh, built the first syst uh, AO system, adaptive optics system. Uh, the compensated imaging system on Hawaii, and in the late 80s, the first astronomical use adaptive optic systems come on, as, as it was called, installed at the uh, Observatoire Haute Provence and uh, uh, at uh, ESO in La Silla, that's the European uh, uh, Space uh, um, Observatory. All right. So that was, yeah, we get from this fuzzy blob. Actually, we found that this fuzzy blob is not a fuzzy blob, but two fuzzy blobs. <laughs> well, it's a binary system, as I would say it if this was, yeah, uh, at an astronomical conference. Um, but yeah, you disentangle uh, things you, cannot, you could not see before. OK, how does this AO system look like in principle? So again, we have the stars somewhere. We have learned already that we do have, actually you see this uh, slight Schlieren pattern in the air from the warm and the exhaust from the, uh, yes, there's a bit of flimmering in the background and that's, that's seeing, okay? So the image is not as sharp here as it comes from the projector there. Uh, okay, that comes from somewhere and then we need a system which has three components. One is a deformable mirror, the other is a wavefront sensor, and the, other, uh, the third one is a real-time computer. We need something 
to actually measure what is going on, then we need to take this measurement and extract some information from this um, measurement, and then we need something which can correct this wave front, straighten it out, so to speak, because we want to have it straight again. So the wave front sensor sends some information uh, to the real-time computer. This some information, namely, is what is the curvature? How does this wiggle thingy look like, the wave front? And that real-time computer computes then information that goes to the deformable mirror, and that is in real time shaped to an arbitrary shape, counteracting that um, incoming wavefront, and then straightening it out. So we do have a light path like this first, so it goes on this deformable mirror, goes on something else, which I will come to in a minute, and then on this wavefront sensor. And of course, that means if you run it, um, you do have a uh, control loop meaning you measure something here at the wavefront, you put the information into there, feeding that into the deformable mirror, that deforms somehow, modifies this uh, wavefront that comes from above, and then of course you want to uh, have a feedback loop, is that what I did enough, do I have to do more, and also, of course, the next, uh, in the next second or split second, this pattern will have changed, because the atmosphere is dynamic. If it wasn't dynamic, we don't need to do this in real time, but we have to do it in real time. Real time meaning we have to do this correction and a calculation and sensing uh, at a rate of about one kilohertz, so a thousand times a second. Then we have a scientific instrument because actually we do want to see uh, uh, what is in there, and so this thing in the middle is a beam splitter. It lets it takes some of the light, puts it to the wavefront sensor, not all, because most of it shall go into the scientific instrument. And there, as you see here, then the wavefront is straightened out again, and then I can focus it into my instrument. To do actually that, I have to do, this is the one slide in this talk with a, a Greek uh, uh, <laughs> symbol. Uh, you have this incoming wavefront, uh, which is shown in orange, and then you do a piecewise linear fit, which is an approximation of the slope of it actually, how it looks like. It's uh, um, put into linear pieces, and this, uh, the size of uh, what is normally can be taken as a linear uh, fit piece is roughly 10 to 15 centimeters for good observation sites, while this thing here, so this is the primary mirror of the telescope, which collects all the light that comes from uh, outer space is usually, for the big telescopes, um, at this point, uh, 8 to 10 meters. Okay, um, but how do we get this slope? Now, we, we know that we can approximate it in pieces, but how do we get the slope? Because we need these slopes, of course, fed into this um, deformable mirror to maybe, okay, if it comes like this, I go like this, and it comes in nicely or comes out nicely. So in this way, a uh, sensor comes in, there are different types of these sensors, but the one we are using is a so-called Sheck hartmann sensor, and it looks like this. Uh, we have, this is the ideal case, of course. So we have an incoming planar wavefront, straight on. Then we do have an array of lenses, so it's just one, two, th uh, one, two three, four lenses, uh, and then in an array, like four by four, and they all focus what is coming in into, onto a detector. And if this wavefront that is coming in is planar, like this, on the left, then you do get a regular spaced grip of focus points. In this case, 4 times 4, so 16. If now the incoming wavefront is not planar, it looks like this. So the focus points do move a bit because, well, it came maybe like this, so the focus is offset. I will flip it back and forth uh, again, so it's looking like this. And you see, of course, you do know what is perfect, meaning they are, they are at their designated grid points. If it's imperfect, well, well then just measure the deviation from their uh, zero position, so to speak, and then you do have a proxy for this slope. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than that. There is uh, our matrices involved, which are not necessarily uh, uh, quadratic. 
and you have to invert them, and if you don't, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> They're pr pretty clever people and programmers working on these type of, uh, of uh, problems, and this is actual current research. This is, this is far from done, this field. Okay, so suppose we do have the slopes, then we take a deformable mirror, and this is the zero approximation, zero's order approximation of a deformable mirror. Let's say your wavefront looks like that. Well, then take just a mirror, which is maybe recessed a bit in the middle, the other type forward. It bounces on this mirror, and because there is something sticking out there and in there, well, if, you, if that approaches there, goes back, and in the end, the whole thing, when it has been reflected, is planar again. Okay. That is, well, as said, the uh, easiest order approximation for that. It's a bit more complicated. Your incoming wavefront doesn't look like that. It's more, more, uh, normally a bit more complex. And that means you do have to have more um, wobbling in your deformable mirror. You could do this, that's in the upper um, diagram. You could do this with a membrane which is continuous or maybe it's also in pieces, um, and these segments are driven up and down or maybe tilted by piezo uh, stages that are put underneath. Remember, they have to do this like a thousand times a second. Or you could do something like you take uh, two piezoelectric wafers, they have opposite polarization, put electrodes in between, and then when you apply a voltage to these blue electrodes, then you have local bending. So the one thing will bend up, the other ones will bend in the opposite direction, and then you do have changing curvature on this whole thing. Um, it's not that easy, of course, in reality, because they are not completely independent. One cell will influence the other, and yes. But this is the, the basic principle. Okay, um, now you have seen there was this beam splitter, so most of the thing goes into the science instrument and some goes to our wavefront sensor of the light. Uh, if the object we want to record, like a galaxy that is 11 billion light years away, then this galaxy is too faint. We can't analyze its light, so what do we do? Uh, we need maybe a star that is nearby. So our galaxy, which we actually do want to observe, is the red thingy. The bright star is the yellow one. And if they are reasonably close together, reasonably close meaning about 10 to 20 arc seconds. Uh, if you uh, stretch your arm and look at your uh, uh, little finger at the fingernail, this is about 30 arc minutes. One arc minute has 60 arc seconds, so it's very close. It's not the galaxy is there and the star is there. No, it's there. Um, because if you have a large separation, then they do sense different turbulence. Simple as that. Um, now, the thing is that less than 10% of the objects you have on sky, which you're normally interested, do have a sufficiently close and bright star nearby. So what to do? And now we come to the lasers. <laughs> <laughs> ah. <laughs> because if you don't have your, well, if they don't want to play nicely, well, build your own theme park with, yes, you know. <laughs> so, make your own star. This is what we do. Because if the star is not nearby, a sufficiently bright one, well, be why, why has it to be sufficiently bright? Because if you want to do this computation a thousand times a second, well, then the time you can, uh, uh, the time for your CCD, uh, where you record this image from the wavefront, well, is uh, it's a, 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 a thousandth of a second. And if you don't have enough photons in a thousandth of a second, well, then there is no computation of this offset of these little green dots on their grid. So you need a lot of photons. So let's get enough photons. And there are actually two things what you can do. There is a conveniently placed sodium layer in the upper atmosphere. <laughs> uh, it's 90 kilometers above ground, and there's a sodium layer. And uh, what you actually can do is you can take a laser on ground here, and then shoot a laser which corresponds to the energy transition of these sodium atoms. 
um, which is 589.2 nanometers, it's orange, um, and excite those atoms up there in the atmosphere, and they will start to glow. And if you have a focus, if you focus it in there, and then you have a, uh, a, a blob of sodium atoms lighting up in the upper atmosphere, maybe whatever, some hundred meters long and some meters wide, as big as your focus is there. This can be done with a continuous laser. Um, this has been done in the past, yes, of course. Um, and actually, the first uh, instruments were built like that. Um, the thing is, in those days, they were very, very expensive. There is no sodium laser. There are only uh, uh, dye lasers, and they are messy uh, and expensive. Nowadays, we can build this uh, as fiber lasers, but not 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Uh, another solution is to actually use the Rayleigh um, scattering in the atmosphere. You use a, a neodymium yak laser, which is 532 nanometers, it's green, it's easily available, it's cheap compared to the other one. And then uh, you focus it uh, in the atmosphere. The only thing is uh, you will do have backscatter of photons all along the way. So you have to think about how can I only record light from a certain height above ground? Because otherwise, I don't have a spot because I have ew, a laser beam column somewhere there. OK, how do these things look like? Can we dim these lights actually a bit? Or is, there, is it only an off switch? Can you check on this thing? Yeah, let's, let's check on that. Let's just, just push the button. Come on. No. 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> it's still on here. <laughs> All right. It's looking like this. Um, who has been at the camp? There was an astronomy talk at the camp from Liz. OK. Uh, actually, uh, if this uh, talk had been tomorrow, we would have had a live conference to that size, because Liz is right now here. And she sent me that picture uh, uh, just some hours ago. That's how they just uh, do things on Paranal in Chile. Um, the thing I will talk about is the green one to the right. Uh, that's the thing I have been involved with. Uh, yeah, let's look into that. So if you shoot the laser into uh, the atmosphere, of course, you do have a problem. The star is very far away, it's infinitely far away, and the light that comes down is in a cylinder. And if you shoot a laser up, it's a cone. So you only probe the green region, and the unsampled volume of turbulence is to the side. That is a problem with our laser AO. Another problem we face is this one. When we take a star to measure the wavefront, then it passes only once through the atmosphere. The laser beam goes up and down. And so there is a component called tip-tilt component, which is actually just the thing moving around. It's not just this, the, the, the phase uh, that gets uh, disturbance that's been introduced in the wavefront, but this moving around. Not the, so not the uh, uh, bright uh, and more or less bright uh, twinkling uh, little star thingy, but the moving around. And that can be not be sensed with a laser guide star. So whenever we do laser AO, we do need another star to get this component. But this star can be a bit further away, like an arc minute or two arc minutes or so. So it's that, and that, that is why there are enough. And then we should think about actually what we have to correct. And so we should make a profile of the turbulence um, above ground. And this is how it looks like. And for example, for the uh, site where we are there in uh, Arizona, we see that most of the turbulence is actually just uh, above the ground. So we maybe should care mostly above the ground layer. It's not so much about the high altitude things. So, and then what we do is, well, we want to sample the ground stuff nicely, so we just don't take one, but three lasers. Um, so, to fill uh, this area nicely. Uh, and yes, of course, we can also combine this, and <laughs> it looks like that. 
Uh, this combination we will not talk about today. We will only talk about that. Um, this is how it looks like. So this is our telescope, the primary mirror, which receives the light from uh, outer space. It then deflects on the secondary tertiary and then somewhere here. But first, we need to have to shoot the laser up. And it's uh, launched from a laser box onto a mirror behind that uh, secondary mirror over there into the atmosphere. And after uh, 40 microseconds, it reaches an altitude of 12 kilometers. And of course, it comes back. After 80 microseconds, it's here in our detector again. So the star then lights up, has this cone, gets focused there, focus reflected to here. And we do have our signal in our detector after 80 uh, microseconds. And as said, because of course the laser uh, has scattering all along its path, you, will, you want to gate this information to 12 kilometers. And well, then you just, just look at when your laser pulse started. Wait, 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 wait. Open the shutter for the detector for a short uh, time. After 80 microseconds, close it again, and then analyze and read out what you just did. Easy, huh? So we're done. Thank you for coming to my talk. And now go out and build your own lasers with <laughs> two. Now we're going to look at this thing uh, which is actually built and which works. So this is called Argos. It's a ground layer AO system. That's what we want to build. It has wild field correction. That means you cannot correct just a tiny patch on sky, but for astronomical use, a huge area, meaning it's not just a circle of 10 arc seconds, but this thing can correct four by four arc minutes, which is huge. So all the objects that are in there. Uh, we have a multi-laser Constellation, we have seen that. Why we need this? Because we want to fill the complete ground layer. So we have three uh, laser guide stars per eye. Why per eye? This will be clear in a minute. Uh, and we use high power, power pulsed green lasers. And uh, this deformable mirror is actually built in the telescope system already. The secondary mirror is the deformable mirror, which is very convenient because then all the in uh, instruments that sit on the telescope can benefit from this system. It's installed at this telescope. Looks pretty odd, yes, I admit that. That's the large binocular telescope. It's two telescopes on one mount, one primary, two primaries. It's roughly 23 by 25 by 12 meters. It sits on Mount Graham in Arizona. Um, and it has an adaptive secondary mirror, which is this uh, uh, violet color uh, thingy up there in the middle on top. This is how it looks like. Um, this is the control room where you sit. This is, this stays fixed. All this shiny part rotates. That's the actual telescope, the red thing that moves up and down. So the whole building rotates and moves up and down. Uh, it's uh, from f uh, the uh, ceiling as is at level uh, level 11. So when you actually sit there, um, you can. Uh, Watch uh, around a bit. So, uh, okay, that's outside. It's winter. Ooh. Okay, let's see. And there, you, there's a ladder. Okay. Uh huh. Yes, this thing is huge. Yes. Okay. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Nice. Cool. Okay. Uh, that's how it's looked like when you are, when you're actually there. Um. Okay. Our system layout is like this. We have this secondary adaptive secondary mirror, which is the deformable mirror. Uh, we have the uh, primary tertiary that is clear already. So we have a laser box. Um, the green thingies being the lasers themselves. Um, so that's how it looks like. We produce some laser beams. We have steering mirrors in there to get them into the right pattern on sky, of course. We do have control cameras. If it's, is the focus right? Is the position right? This is one a control loop, another control loop, another control loop, another control loop. The black thing is the shutter, because we have to close this whole thing when aircrafts are overhead, when satellites are overhead. So if you want to use this system, you have to uh, put six weeks in advance. You have to put out your list of observable targets to some military agency, and they will tell you, OK, not OK, OK, not OK, not OK, not OK, OK. Not OK meaning something is passing overhead. Hmm, what could this be? <laughs> hmm. 
Um, of course, at some point, the lasers come down again in this cone shape. They will reach the primary mirror. Uh, and ultimately, it will end up in the wavefront sensor, which is much more complex than just this box um, I showed you before. So there are acquisition cameras which detect, are we at the right spot? Do the uh, spots get onto the detector in a nice in a nice fashion. We do have to do this gating, remember? We have to open this shutter for the CCD when we want to record the light for this tiny fraction after 80 microseconds, after the laser pulse has been launched. Um, that's done in here. These are Pockel cells, so it's an electro-optical effect. Um, and then there's also something uh, in addition, because, well, I said we can't do without the tip tilt. And there's another unit in here that sits right in front of the science instrument that detects this tip tilt star, this additional star. Um, and so you have the laser wavefront light, the green one. You do have this tip tilt light, the blue one. And you do have the actual science light from the object you want to uh, observe on sky that goes directly into the scientific instrument in the end. And then you have a lot of uh, control things. Of course, you do need a common clock for this uh, synchronization of all these pulses and the gating and whatnot. And of course, you need the information for the tip-tilt component and for the wavefront into this computer, which sends then all the slopes. You remember, we have to do this linear approximation piecewise, yes? Into the secondary mirror, which then deforms in real time and does this a thousand times a second. This is how it looks like. Um, so when I'm there, I'm roughly that tall. Uh, the two black tubes right in the middle, uh, those are the two tubes which go up. Um, looks like this. So this is how the components are distributed over the telescope. Once back, okay. Primary mirror, primary mirror, some instruments in the middle, some tertiary mirror, the secondaries, the adaptive ones up there. Yes, I hate to use, I hate to use these, 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 these laser pointers. I, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm always going like this. <laughs> it's my man. <laughs> So, okay, so we do have the uh, so we do have the adaptive secondary up there, and then it goes back on the tertiary down there, and then goes over into the science instrument or the wavefront sensors and whatnot. Um, again, we do have a laser system. We have to place somewhere a launch system for the laser, a dichroic to uh, separate between the laser light, the tip tilt light, and the science light. We do have to have a wavefront sensor to check how the wavefront looks like. We do have to have this tip tilt control. We have a, yeah, a calibration source would be nice to calibrate the system during daytime. Aircraft detection, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Satellite avoidance, also an issue here. And a control software. There are uh, many people just writing, just, haha. <laughs> writing software for this, and this is, 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 this is really hard. Um, some are also on this conference. They don't want to be pointed out, as I learned, but you will find them at the conference if you look at the right places. That's where the uh, laser box is located. Um, just next to it is the electronics rack. Um, how does this thing look like? So that is our, one of our lasers. It's about 20 watts. Don't get your finger in there. <laughs> it really hurts. Uh, and if you know, you, th there's a mandatory uh, annual laser training, of course. Um, yes. Um, and if you want to have something like this at home, you do need a huge refrigerator next to it just for the cooling of that thing. This is nothing you want to have at home. Just because it's, it's, it's that bulky, it's nothing, no, it's, it, it, no, it's not. <laughs> because actually, when you do this green laser pointer thingy, then there's always this, yeah, don't use it for more than 10 seconds. Because why? Because the crystal inside heats up. And if you can't dissipate that heat, the crystal at some point breaks. And then your laser pointer is broken. This thing gets continuously cooled. 
So therefore, it's a bit more expensive. <laughs> uh, if you then put it up, so this is still on the lab table when it was integrated and tested, and then at some point it gets put all in a box with all these control mirrors and cameras and whatnot. But finally, you see in the middle on this picture there is a focusing lens, and then you see these three tiny little beams coming out of there, which then expand on Skywell, like in, in that size, of course, um, if they're in 12 kilometers height, but that's how they come out of it. And if you uh, install this in the telescope, you actually have to tilt the telescope, because otherwise you can't reach it, and then you need your climbing gear. Um, so once you have produced the lasers, you need to propagate them to, uh, through a dust tube onto a launch mirror, a folding mirror, and from there to a launch mirror. Yes, and then it looks like this. Okay. So the lasers come from here into that, and then over to the other side, over the secondary mirror, and then being shot right up into space, like this. Okay, so if you want to have that at home. Yeah. But I can tell you, the whole facility does uh, cost less than one fully equipped Eurofighter. <laughs> Okay, thank you for taking the hint. <laughs> yeah, that's how it looks like. It's, yes, it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I have to admit, these are a bit longer exposures. It's not that bright and green when you are actually at the telescope up there, but if you have been in the dark long enough, around 10 minutes, then it really becomes bright. There's a little telescope that observes where actually the spots are on sky, and if we have clear sky, then we have this constellation on the right, so that is how the lasers come up. As said, they, you, you do see them all of the way up, but we are interested in the little dots at the end. You can barely see them. If there are high clouds, well, <laughs> then we produce something like this. <coughs> uh, we have the uh, dichroic when the light comes back down, as said, which separates the science light in red and the laser light in green. This is how it looks like. Uh, actually, the dichroic is right in front of Sebastian there. Uh, and from there, it gets then reflected on a reflector and then up into the uh, wavefront sensing unit. Uh, so there is the dichroic, there is uh, the reflector, and then it goes over in this unit, which is the wavefront sensing unit. Uh, which sits there at the sign. That's how it looks when it gets installed. And that's how it looks inside. So you have the three laser beams coming from the side, from the sky, of course. You have patrol cameras which monitor where are these. Uh, are, they at the right, uh, uh, are they at the right spot? Do we have to steer the lasers a bit? Um, then uh, we have some control uh, for the position of the laser spots and the field. Um, the pockel cells are the ones that do this uh, opening and closing in front of the shutter. You can't use a mechanical shutter in front of the CCD. You have to do this uh, electro-optically. So you, you, you have a polarization uh, of the laser beams and you have a, a polarize, uh, polarizer, a cross polarizer, and then you just turn the polarization of the crystals. Uh, it's an electro-optical effect. Uh, and then it gets uh, passed through or it gets blocked. Um, then you also, uh, of course, have the lenslet arrays in there and then the CCD, um, which actually records this dot pattern. You remember this four by four? Well, it's not four by four. In our case, we do have a bit more resolution. Um, the uh, sensor reads uh, looks like this. This is uh, actually a custom built CCD. Uh, very special, the imaging area is in the middle, and when you read out the thing, um, you split the uh, image in half, you transfer it to the sites, to the frame store area, and then read it out, because read out is slow, transfer is fast, and you have to do this uh, a thousand times a second. At very low readout noise, which is only four electron readout noise, um, for the experts here in the audience, uh, this is very good. 
Um, it's not many pixels, but it's more than enough for us. So how does this look like? It looks like that. So there you have your pattern again, your regularly spaced pattern. Of course, from three laser guide stars, you get three patterns. And then you analyze, well, the position, the relative position, uh, the absolute position of those dots on their grid, and somehow compute the slopes from there, feed them back, into, uh, compute them actually electrical information from them, which you can then feed into your deformable mirror again, which sits on top of the telescope. And then hopefully everything works. Uh, this you can digest at home. <laughs> it's in the stream now, so it will be saved for all eternity and all the aliens which record the electromagnetic field from like most well, Bielefeld. Ooh. Anyway, uh, so just in short, there is uh, down in green, there is this thing that goes up fro from the lasers to uh, through some steering uh, mirrors. We have diagnostics and we go to a, a, foc uh, a focus uh, check, a launch mirror one and launch mirror two onto sky. And then we go back uh, up there, M1 is the primary mirror. And then we go uh, through this whole chain and there are various control loops sitting in there. Um, and all these things have to talk together on very high uh, rates. Um, sometimes you see one kilohertz. Uh, other things are a bit slower. But this all needs highly sophisticated control software. Um, and the uh, programmers can be real proud of what they did in the past with all these control loops. Uh, the tip tilt is very is much 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 easier because well, you, you remember this tip tilt so ju just the moving around so you have four quadrants at a little cell and if it moves to somewhere up down left right you can easily detect that and that is fed into a uh, array of four uh, avalanche photodiodes uh, to actually record this and for that we don't need uh, many photons so this tip tilt star can comparably be uh, be comparably dim. The calibration unit for daytime calibration can be put into the beam so these arms can swing over, over the primary mirror, and then we can inject artificial stars uh, via a hologram um, into the whole unit during daytime and calibrate this whole thing. And then, yes, we are back here. This is how we look like. And, yeah, maybe concentrate on these two areas first. I will flip back and forth many times. Um, but yeah, what is this? Are these two stars which are just fuzzy and dim? Or is this an extended object? The upper one may be a galaxy because it's elongated. OK, concentrate on that. No, it's actually just a bunch of stars. And this is over a huge field, so the, uh, the correction is not just in the middle, but you can see also at the very edges of this image, we do see this improvement in image quality. Of course, you can have the diagram if you want. So the blue line is without the thing being activated, open loop. And if we close the control loop to do this measurement and correction in real time, we do squeeze all the energy into very uh, few pixels, which of course also mean our signal to noise level in a single pixel goes up tremendously, meaning you can decrease your exposure time, which is important. If you want to observe galaxies at these telescopes, it's $200 a minute. Not cheap. Okay, um, good. So uh, the thing, just last week, uh, there was another commissioning run, testing commissioning run for this system. And my colleagues, uh, Rossi Borelli and Lorenzo Busoni, have done a nice video. Uh, the music, by the way, hello gamer, <laughs> it's royalty free. So. <laughs> so if it was now darker, therefore I asked, uh, this would come m up nicer, but let's see. There is sound, hopefully. So the sound guys, let's see.
Ja, frzz. Uh, of course, this is a longer exposure. It's not that uh, Star Wars-like. I would have loved to use some Star Wars tunes along that, but yeah, you know, all these rights and whatnot. Yes, uh, anyway. That's how it looks like. So you have three laser beams per eye, per telescope. Remember, we have two telescopes and one mount. They look roughly in the same direction, but still. So if you observe two telescopes at the same time, it's only $100 a minute. Um, yeah, um, this is, well, not so much uh, the shiny part uh, on the dome itself, but if you actually do stand on the mountain during night and are a bit dark adapted, you see the laser uh, beams like that. Um, and uh, don't be fooled, if you are at the valley or very far away, you hardly see them. You don't see them at all. You see them there. If you are two kilometers off-site already, it's merely a dim greenish something. If you are down in the valley 10 kilometers off, you don't see them anymore. If you take a camera, five minutes exposure, yes, but otherwise, no. There is no such thing as the people in the valley down uh, can see like these laser pew pew every night and <laughs> no. <laughs> <coughs> no, nothing. Okay, which gets me to the last part. How do you become and how do you work as a laser rocket scientist? <laughs> um, yes, I put this in the talk directly because I do get this question in the Q&A normally when I talk about these things. And it's always like, well, well, what do I need to do if I want to do this? Uh, and maybe you have already an idea about this because you have seen how complex this thing is. And um, there are so many things to do in these kind of projects and on various levels, also in administration, also being senior people, new people, maybe master uh, uh, thesis works on that or uh, uh, bachelor or PhD or then as a postdoc, it's very complex. Yes, and it's not only about just shooting the lasers in the end, sometimes it's just checking the cables. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it needs to be done. Um, there is a tremendous amount of electronics and electrics involved. There are all the mechanical components in such a system are custom built. Either the institutes build it themselves or they give it uh, out of house. There are these real-time computers, for example. This is, by the way, our real-time computer from Micrograde. Uh, if you want to look that up, it's a company uh, who builds these things. They need to be programmed. And, uh, oh, actually, if somebody is here in the audience with really hardcore experience on real-time computing, coding, on such thingies, do talk to me. <laughs> um, yeah, this is how our software system looks like a very small part of the GUIs. It's a, lot of, uh, it's a lot of code and a lot of work and a lot of sleepless nights in front of these computers and just testing it and testing it and then testing some more and testing even more. And so to be involved in these kind of projects, you don't need to be a laser physicist because there is no one thing. If you want to take one, uh, three messages out of this, it's, it's a team effort. There are many tasks and there are many jobs and you have to pick one. Because in this one job you do in these projects, you have to be very, very, very good. Because there are other people that are very, very, very good. If you work in these kind of projects, if you meet a new person for the first time, just assume that he or she knows everything about this and you know nothing. W you will soon, s uh, you will quickly realize if, it's, if that is true, uh, but otherwise, if you assume it the other way around, you just make a fool of yourself, okay? Don't do that. People in science, second most important thing, if you really want to go into this, people in science are just like people outside science. Meaning, you will meet nice people and you will meet <laughs> just like in life. It's not that these Things are spheres where people are, 
you know, floating above the lab surface in nice colored. <laughs> no, it's hard work. Um, and if you actually go into this, like study physics, or maybe if you want to construct these, of, of course, the, all the drawings are done by people who have learned this in their studies. So Maschinenbau, whatever. Go for that one. Building optics needs optics experience. If you want to actually build stuff, well, there are many people in these institutes or universities who work in the mechanical fabrication departments or electronics departments. They just do uh, PCB layouting all the time, but these things do need sophisticated electronics, and this is all custom built. This is nothing you can buy off the shelf, nothing of it, almost nothing. And this means you might end up at something equally cool. It's not that you can have this one thing and then, bam, 10 years later, you will be the laser rocket scientist. You won't. You might become one, and then even after 10 years, you might realize this is not the thing you want to do forever. So I have to correct uh, the introduction in one point. I'm no longer working there. I recently left. I'm now, I, I now have my own company. I'm still involved in these things. I do calculation for these two kinds of things, but I'm not at an institute anymore because I decided, for example, for me, that the contract conditions in this type of scientific work are not of the type which I uh, want to um, live with anymore, like one-year contracts. <laughs> and so there are many ways of being involved in this. And don't just, don't just focus on this. Focus on what you really want to do, and you might end up in this. And if you don't, well, you do something equally cool. Questions? Okay. First of all, thank you for our daily dose of lasers. Um, I have a sad, so I have kind of sad news because we have really not much time left to Q&A. So I'm first asking the signal angel if there are any questions from the internet because it's, was that a two? Two, okay, because right. these people can't ask questions afterwards, so... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll be all Congress, and if you want to reach me directly, 7319 is this telephone. <laughs> okay, so the signal angel question. Yeah, the first question from the internet was how strong the laser actually is, or it could be any danger for something in the vicinity. Um, actually, no. So we shoot up around 15 to 20 watts per laser beam, 
um, if there was actually a plane flying through our laser beam, um, then nothing happens to the pilots. They don't get blinded or whatnot because it's di uh, and the beam size at that altitude is, is so big already. They will, of course, go like, Ook, what is this? And that's what we, uh, what we don't want to want because then they might push some other buttons which they're not supposed to push. <laughs> um, if you, of course, work directly at the system, you have to maintain it, you open it, you have to uh, align the lasers and whatnot beyond the, the, the self-aligning capabilities. You do have to wear all these protective laser goggles and whatnot, because if you, do, if you don't, you do have instant eye damage. It's not that, no, it's instant. You, don't, might, you might not see it instantly, but the instant, uh, it's there instantly, period. So, really. Folks, don't experiment on this laser stuff at home if you are not following basic laser safety rules. Not prying these things from the DVD burners and whatnot, Blu-ray thingies. <laughs> Does it really work? <laughs> just, just don't. It's, it, your eyesight is not worth it, period. It's not. Please remember to cover your still working eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only look into the laser beam with your remaining eyes. Um. <laughs> The other question? And the second question from the internet was, uh, it was actually commenting that it's a very cool concept already in use, and where do you see this going in the next 10 years? So what's the outlook for uh, observation from the Earth's surface uh, in the next 10 years? Oh, of course, uh, the telescope will get bigger and bigger. The next generation of telescope is coming up in the 2020s. The European Extremely Large Telescope will be uh, uh, roughly around 40 meters in diameter. These are so huge, they can't work in seeing limited operation anymore. They do have to have uh, laser AO all the time. Uh, it will look similar to this, so this is in this sense also a technology demonstrator. There will be a combined thing. Uh, you may remember this uh, diagram with the uh, one uh, sodium laser in the middle and the others outside, so these co combined things. And then you can also imagine something that you probe different heights in the atmosphere because you do have different um, turbulence layers. And all of these then have their own deformable mirror. So it very gets a very complex setup, multi-conjugate AO as it's called. Um, and then there are, of course, new, um, uh, there's research being done on how to detect uh, this uh, wavefront most efficiently. Um, and there's a so-called thing called the pyramid sensor. Uh, you can uh, look for that also. We do have one in our system. And this is very efficient. So it takes uh, much less photons to get to the same signal to noise level. Um, it, this is active research and, uh, well, every major telescope, of course, now has this and every big telescope in the future will have this all over the place. Okay, um, we're completely out of time again. So, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Um,